Good evening and welcome. Thank you very much for our attending our virtual event tonight, What's New in Cancer Care. Tonight, you will hear from four of Hogue's subspecialty cancer specialists representing three of our innovative programs that are available to patients in our community. I have the very distinct pleasure of introducing you to my boss, your moderator for the evening, and the leader of the Hogue Family Cancer Institute and the Grace E. Hogue Endowed Chair, Dr. Burton Eisenberg. Dr. Eisenberg joined Hogue about seven years ago. He joined as a very experienced researcher, a surgical oncologist with a subspecialty in melanoma and sarcoma, and as an experienced cancer center leader. His experience was accumulated over the years in, in the likes of MD Anderson, Memorial Sloan Kettering, Fox Chase, and most recently before he joined Hogue at Dartmouth Hitchcock. In addition to this significant experience, Dr. Eisenberg served our country as a Colonel in our Air Force. Without further um, ado, I'd like to introduce to you Dr. Burton Eisenberg. Hello and welcome. Uh, and I hope you will enjoy tonight's uh, presentation. There'll be an opportunity to ask some questions at the end of the, of the uh, presentations and we will welcome that. Uh, and thank you, Dory, for the introduction. Dory is my counterpart in helping to build the programs that you will see here as well as others of distinction that are changing cancer care uh, landscape in Orange County. It's my uh, pleasure uh, to introduce the first speaker uh, of tonight's program, Dr. Gary Ulaner. Dr. Ulaner is presently the director of Hoag's Molecular Imaging and Therapy Program. Hoag recruited Dr. Ulaner from Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York City to open the molecular imaging and therapy program at Hogue and is the first hospital in Orange County to have uh, this kind of facility. He has a medical degree and a PhD in cancer biology from Stanford University and completed residencies in radiology and nuclear medicine at USC. And Dr. Ulaner is a nationally recognized expert in the use of targeted imaging and therapeutics and he has brought several NIH-funded uh, clinical trials to Hogue, uh, placing Hogue at a, on a national uh, program for cancer care. Dr. Ulaner. Thank you so much, Dr. Eisenberg, for that introduction. And allow me to share my screen. My name is Gary Ulaner and I'm the Director of Molecular Imaging and Therapy at the Hogue Family Cancer Institute. And I'd like to uh, uh, introduce uh, the audience to molecular imaging and therapy uh, and where it can assist uh, patients uh, with their imaging and their care. Now, here are my disclosures. I also disclose uh, that I believe in teaching molecular imaging and therapy uh, starting at a very early age uh, here uh, are my, uh, my son, Ilya, and my daughter, Annabelle, uh, participating in a molecular imaging and therapy educational course uh, that I uh, used to run prior to the uh, COVID era, and uh, we will uh, run again. Uh, because this was um, uh, a little while ago, I show a, a, a slide of uh, what my two uh, young molecular imagers uh, look like today, uh, along with my wife. So here is the basic concept for how molecular imaging and therapy works. Each type of cancer cell expresses unique molecules within and on the surface of the cells. And these can be thought of as targets. Right? And we can develop uh, agents that bind to those targets, very similar to the way that a, a key binds to a specific lock so that these binding agents will hit the target that we're looking for on the individual cancer cells 
and thus uh, uh, allow us uh, to visualize and treat those cancer cells while sparing normal tissues that don't express the target that, uh, uh, that our agent will bind. Now onto that binding agent or key that fits into that target or lock, we can add what's known as a radioisotope. That's a big word for something that emits radiation. If we add a radioisotope that emits a very small amount of radiation, then our key, which binds to the specific target on a cancer cell, can be used to image those cancer cells in something called a positron emission tomography or PET scanner. If we replace that low energy radioisotope with a very high energy radioisotope, then we can bring high amounts of uh, radiation right up against the cancer cell and affect uh, a, a killing of those cancer cells. So molecular imaging and therapy is truly using individual molecules that bind to specific cancer cells to image those cancer cells with low radiation or treat those cancer cells with high energy radiation. And I'll discuss uh, a few applications of molecular imaging and therapy that we have active here at HOG today. The first will be in patients with, uh, for imaging prostate cancer. So the cancer cell that we're targeting is the prostate cancer. The target is known as prostate-specific membrane antigen, or PSMA, which is expressed on virtually all prostate cancer cells. We have a binding agent, which is a molecule, which I refer, will refer to as PYL, that binds very nicely to that target, much like a key binding to a lock. And that PYL is radio-labeled with an isotope that emits a small amount of radiation. In this case, we call this fluorine 18. And this allows us a really nice, to, uh, the, to use a really nice key that allows us to image the location of prostate cancer cells. And this molecular imaging uh, is far more sensitive for detection of prostate cancer malignancy, allowing us to see deposits of tumor that are one-tenth to one one hundredth the size that can be detected on what otherwise current standard of care methods like bone scans or CT scans. I'll show a, a specific patient example. This is a patient with newly diagnosed prostate cancer whose plan was to undergo prostatectomy to remove the tumor. And indeed, if the cancer is confined to the prostate, and you remove the prostate through surgery, that is a, a, a very effective method of treating localized prostate cancer. However, this patient was able to be shown on our molecular imaging study that the tumor had unfortunately spread from the prostate into lymph nodes in the pelvis and up into the abdomen, as well as disease spread into bones. And with this spread, the patient now is at a, unfortunately at a stage of disease where prostate, removing the prostate through prostatectomy will not control the patient's disease because the disease has significantly spread outside of the prostate. This makes a very big difference to this patient because instead of receiving a prostatectomy, they'll now undergo systemic uh, 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 therapies like hormone therapies or potentially subsequently chemotherapies in order to control their tumor that is spread outside their prostate. Now, this is uh, 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 bad news. Uh, it is news that the disease has spread farther than what otherwise was initially thought. However, even though this is bad news, this is very, very important news to have because this patient could have undergone a surgery which could have resulted in uh, adverse effects, such as incontinence or imp impotence. And even though they had, could have had side effects, there was no benefit in this particular patient to perform prostatectomy 
because the disease had already spread so significantly outside of the prostate. This is the power of molecular imaging. We're able to image tumor deposits much, much smaller than previously available, allowing us to uh, 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 design the appropriate treatment route regimens for each individual patient so that they maximize the efficacy of the therapy and minimize side effects. Here's another potential example. Here's another example of how molecular imaging therapy can be used to help patients with prostate cancer. Here's a patient who had prostate cancer that was removed by prostatectomy. And now there's a marker in their blood called PSA, which is rising, telling you that the tumor is somewhere in the body. However, the standard of care imaging, CT scans and bone scans, was unable to identify where the tumor was. Here's our molecular imaging scan, which is able to localize the recurrent tumor to a small lymph node in the pelvis. Now, the patient can receive very targeted radiation to that lymph node and remove uh, the uh, 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 apparent recurrence of disease in this patient. So the molecular imaging and therapy, again, by demonstrating disease that was otherwise undetectable, can have a profound impact on patients with prostate cancer. Beyond prostate cancer imaging, we can perform molecular prostate cancer therapy. In this case, we replace that low energy emitting fluorine 18, which something that emits a much higher amount of radiation. And as we said earlier, now we can bring very high amounts of radiation right up against the cancer cell to affect the cell kill. This therapy has been utilized uh, to very effectively treat metastatic prostate cancer which has been resistant to other forms of therapy. This is one particular patient who has received uh, uh, this targeted molecular therapy. And this is a, a depiction of the extent of their disease in red prior to therapy with very little to no disease detectable after therapy. And in addition, that blood marker for PSA drops by more than a hundredfold. In addition to patients with uh, 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 benefits for patients with prostate cancer, we can utilize molecular imaging and therapy uh, for benefit for patients with breast malignancies. In this case, the cancer cell is a breast cancer cell, and that target is the estrogen receptor, or ER, which is present on approximately 80 to 85% of breast malignancies. The binding agent we use to hit that target is estrogen, which is already within the body, except we have linked to estrogen, again, one of these low energy emitting radioisotopes, the fluorine 18. And now we have a key that allows us to bind to, to uh, breast cancer cells and visualize the spread of breast cancer. And much like as we described with molecular imaging of prostate cancer, molecular imaging for breast cancer can have extensive impacts uh, on patient care. This is a scan from a patient who was known to have breast and axillary nodal disease, but at initial staging was not thought to have distant metastases. So the plan was for what's known as a mastectomy to remove the primary breast malignancy. However, the molecular imaging scan was able to identify that the patient had spread of disease to the bones, which was not detected on under other imaging modalities. Again, this has a tremendous impact on patient care. Instead of undergoing a mastectomy, uh, uh, which can have side effects such as uh, edema in the, in the, uh, uh, the, on the arm on the side of the breast, this patient would not benefit from having the surgery and instead underwent systemic therapy uh, for their breast malignancy. 
So once again, the identification of more disease than initially thought uh, may seem like bad news, and it is, but it is really important news to have because it prevents you from having therapies that would be ineffective and may have side effects and points you towards having therapies that will have the greatest chance of successful treatment with minimal side effects. This molecular imaging of estrogen receptor also has a very important role in helping to choose what medications patients with breast cancer should undergo. Uh, there are options including hormonal therapies and chemotherapies. And in patients with estrogen receptor positive disease, this specific imaging modality can be utilized. And if the, the, this, the imaging modality does not show uptake uh, uh, on the imaging, it is a very strong predictor that patients will not respond to estrogen target, receptor targeted therapies and they should undergo chemotherapy instead. Let me show two patients uh, uh, that uh, uh, demonstrate this principle. Here's a patient with known lung malignancy, and the patient was positive for this uh, molecular imaging that finds the estrogen receptor. This predicts that the patient has a strong chance of responding to estrogen receptor targeted therapies, which the patient was started on. Whereas here's a patient with known malignancy in the bones, but the estrogen receptor targeted imaging shows that those uh, areas of tumor do not take up our estrogen receptor targeted imaging. If we can't image the estrogen receptor, then that strongly predicts that estrogen receptor targeted therapies as well won't work. And this patient was uh, uh, placed on chemotherapies rather than estrogen receptor targeted hormonal therapies. This is a huge advance in my opinion for imaging because imaging in cancer has traditionally been to find the tumor and determine if that tumor is getting larger or smaller on treatment. In this case, we're using molecular imaging to actually choose what are the best therapies that the patients re will receive. I'll also uh, briefly introduce that we have a molecular imaging project for visualizing CD38 in myeloma. So the target cancer cell is myeloma, which is a bone marrow of a malignancy. The target is the CD38, which is expressed on the surface of the myeloma cell. And we have a binding agent known as daratumumab, which is an antibody that binds to that protein and we can radio label it again with something which admits a small amount of radiation. In this case, we call this is uh, zirconium 89, and it allows us incredibly sensitive detection of myeloma cells uh, within the bones of this patient with myeloma. Here at Hogue, we have a National Institutes of Health NIH uh, uh, funded uh, a clinical trial for evaluating uh, this molecular imaging of patients with myeloma. So as a little summary of some of the trials that we have already active at Hogue for molecular imaging and therapy. Molecular imaging and therapy allows us to detect disease that is currently missed by current standard of care imaging methods. And this really allows us the best opportunity to image cancer and choose the therapies that will work best in individual patients. We have trials for patients with breast cancer. This is estrogen receptor targeted imaging, and it is currently being used to help image patients at initial diagnosis and recurrence of malignancy to find the disease that can't be found on other imaging methods. And it's also used to help determine what therapies the patient should receive. For example, should they receive estrogen receptor targeted therapies or should they use chemotherapies? In prostate cancer, we have prostate-specific membrane antigen-targeted therapies, which also allow us to image prostate cancer at initial diagnosis and at suspected recurrence. And we have a trial open uh, 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 where we're targeting the PSMA with a very high energy emitting molecule that allows us to treat metastatic prostate cancer. 
And then we have a trial in patients with multiple myeloma, which allows us to image uh, a molecule which is expressed on virtually all myeloma cells. This molecular imaging and therapy work is being performed at the, uh, 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 the Irvine uh, Hogue campus on Sand Canyon Avenue. We have a newly opened molecular imaging and therapy center with three treatment rooms, uh, a radioactive lab for the receipt and handling of the agents that we uh, administer to patients, and uh, the, the trials that, I, that I've described here are just a few of the many and growing number of trials that we are offering uh, to help image and treat patients with malignancy. If anyone has any questions uh, or desires uh, information about the trials that we have currently open to help patients, please contact our clinic coordinator, Beth Thompson. Here is her email and phone or you can directly contact me. Here is my email and phone number uh, 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 for your use. That concludes my presentation on molecular imaging and therapy. Next, I'd like to say that we have the true honor of having one of the patients that has been treated at Hogue, uh, 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 both on a clinical trial and, and with uh, standard of care therapy to discuss uh, their experience um, uh, uh, with participation at clinical trials and therapy at Hogue. So I'd really love to be able to introduce now Ms. Uh, uh, Kimberly Reinecke um, uh, uh, to help explain uh, the patient experience uh, uh, at Hogue and, and with molecular imaging and therapy. Kimberly, it's so great to see you again. Hi, Gary. It's so good to be here. Happy to have you help. Thank you so much. Can I start by just asking, um, uh, for your care, why did you choose Hope? Um, you know, Hope is kind of our, our family um, place. That my whole family just went to Hope. I've been with Hope for over 30 years. Um, I never thought I'd be at Hope so many times the last four months after my diagnosis. But uh, my mother uh, was diagnosed with ovarian cancer uh, years ago. Unfortunately, she lost her battle about uh, almost two years ago. But I just always remember the care that my mother had here at Hogue, and I knew that this was the place that I was going to be for um, when I got my diagnosis. Well, I'm, I, 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 we're, we're very happy to be able to provide you care, um, and I'm very sorry um, uh, that your mother eventually lost her battle with the ovarian cancer. Um, uh, uh, we are all here to provide all the support that we can um, uh, for, for you as well as uh, for family, family members. Can I ask, how did you feel um, uh, when you were offered to participate in a clinical trial? You know, when I got my diagnosis, I didn't know anything about, I didn't know anything about your trial or anything, but I was more than happy to um, to assist and, and uh, when I found out I was a, a recipient that I was um, one of the people that could come and be part of your trial, um, it really made a difference again when you were talking earlier about my treatment. So uh, that was one of the the big biggest things for me is that my treatment completely changed after seeing you. Well, I'm glad we had a, 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 an impact on your on your care. So how are you feeling now? Um, uh, and uh, um, uh, what is their, your next steps? <laughs> you know, I really, I feel great. I really do, but I still, it's still very new for me. Um, I was diagnosed mid January um, and the end of January is when I got the call from you, Gary, to say that it, it um, metastasized to my bones. So um, I was gonna go through this five step treatment um, where I was gonna do chemo. I was gonna do uh, uh, surgery. Uh, restruct, uh, reconstructive surgery. I was then I was going to do some um, radiation and then pills. But then after seeing you, my therapy completely changed, and um, I am doing um, these therapeutics instead. So just I know it sounds really easy. It's not that easy, but it's just two pills a day. Um, and so it really did avoid having to do any of those surgeries, any unnecessary things, because now it's just it's it's slowing the progression of my cancer. So. Right now, I feel I feel really great, but I know with any cancer patient, you're, you're dealing with any kind of side effects from from the therapies and so, but all very manageable. So um, I can still work. I can still do all the things that I want to do. I'm even going to Hawaii next month. <laughs> I, 
I wish I would go. I was going to Hawaii as well, Kimberly. That's. I'm so glad that you feel well. Um, that you, that the, the the care we were able to provide for you is allowing you to continue on with your with your life, um, and I I wish for you uh, the greatest success with this therapy and any others in the future. Thank you. You guys have all been so nice and so great. So I feel very privileged to be a part of this um, community. Uh, Hogue welcomes you, and uh, I'm also very fortunate. I feel very fortunate to be part of the, the Hogue community. So thank you so much, Kimberly, for sharing your experience uh, uh, at Hogue and, and with our molecular imaging and therapy trials. Um, uh, it, again, if anyone has any questions or wants further information, I'm available for uh, 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 by phone or email. Please don't hesitate uh, uh, to reach out. And now I'd like to, uh, to turn our uh, program back to our moderator, Dr. Eisenberg. Uh, Bert? Thanks, Gary. That was uh, that was great, and as usual, your presentation very precise. Um, I'd like to then introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Surat Durabi. Dr. Durabi is a clinical genomic scientist and educator, and she'll explain what that is. But she is an integral part of Hoag's Center for Applied Genomic Technologies. In this role. She leads initiatives that further the education and application of oncology precision medicine for both Hogue physicians uh, and patients. And prior to joining Hogue, Dr. Durabi served as a variant scientist at Ambry Genetics. She received her PhD in genetics at Clemson University. So Dr. Durabi, it's all yours. Thank you, Dr. Eisenberg. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Uh, my name is Surat Dorabi. I'm a clinical genomic scientist here at HOAG, part of Precision Medicine Program, or HOAG Center for Applied Genomic Technologies. I will cover precision medicine tonight. What is precision medicine? Precision medicine is changing how we practice medicine. It's an emerging approach for disease prevention and treatment. It takes to account patients variation and changes in gene in addition to other markers, lifestyle and environmental factors. Application of genetic and genomic sequencing and the tools that we currently have in the care of patients to identify and reduce risk of the disease. So uh, we can identify um, a, a patient that has a risk for a disease through genetic counseling and genetic testing program. We can diagnose and add treatment of the disease through precision medicine and also identification of most beneficial and safe therapies. So in order to um, have a precise, precise treatment for the patient, knowing the changes in a gene and a genome not only helps with a treatment with less toxicities, more targeted type of treatment for the patient also. Knowing the changes in the gene could also help to understand if the patient is respond to a therapy or will be resistant to a certain therapy. So not only help to find a treatment and also help us to find out if the treatment would be beneficial to patient or not. What does a precision medicine team offer at Hogue? So we are a group of different uh, clinicians here at Hogue with different specialty working together to, to better serve our patient at Hogue. We send molecular profiling or genetic testing of a tumor for more of our advanced cancer patients or some other um, 
early stage cancers based on the therapies available to them. We extensively review those results, what is beyond the report. The report for those genomic profiling results are limited to what is available in guidelines. We review them extensively to be able to find additional information to help our patients. We run educational seminar series for our clinicians and also for our patients. Precision medicine consults help identify treatment options for the patients. We also do recommendations for genetic testing based on what we find in a tumor. We have this amazing group of genetic counselors that work for us at HOG, part of our team, that we work closely together to help our patients. We often suggest additional testing to follow up based on what we found through the molecular profiling of the tumor. We have molecular case conference that we present cases. We also present and support in all of other specialty case conferences that we have at Hogue. Research initiative is another one of our, our jobs. We, we work closely with our research team. We initiate research that is related to um, um, molecular subtypes, and also we collaborate with other institutions with different research projects. We publish and we present at national and international conferences. So National Human Genome Research Institute every year publish this figure and update it. And it shows the cost per genome testing. And this is the data since 2001. And if you look at this cost, at the end of 2020, we see that the cost per genome went down to 1000 1000 less than $1,000 versus in 2001, we had $100 million. Um, cost per genome. So the reduction in the cost of the genome helped us to better understand different diseases, including cancer, to better understand how we can treat or how we can find the cancer at earlier stage and find the best treatment for the patients. Advances in technology is where how we are here. The major achievements in sequencing technology are shown in this figure. In 1977 was the first publication of sequencing method by Sanger. It's called Sanger Sequencing. And since then, till now, we advanced the technology. You going through 2003, the, the completion of human genome project that's helped us to understand the human genome, going through the cancer genome sequence, and then now we can do somatic um, mutations, the mutation that you can find in a tumor, we can also detect them in a the blood sample if we don't have a tumor sample. So this advance in technology is very exciting time for, for our field to be able to better understand cancer and better understand treat uh, patients. So precision medicine, the underlying goal for precision medicine actually is to steer away from the one size fit all size. If you look at the figure on the left shows one size fit all medicine, meaning that if, for example, all these patients have the same kind of cancer, they would be treated the same. And this is, this is is how we treated patients um, for, for, for many years. But would you, when you look at uh, through the right and going through the precision medicine, we slowly change and stratified patient based on different markers and different items. You can see by disease type, demographics, changes in the DNA or biomarkers in a tumor. We also take into consideration the medication histories, clinical features, preferences, behavior, lifestyle, environmental factor, a lot of factors to put in to have a precision medicine, a best treatment for that specific patient. One of the examples are shown here is molecular subtyping of specific markers. This is an example of a colorectal cancer. All the, on the figures on the types so or the, the top are the patients with colorectal cancer. We can do tumor subtyping, meaning that we can have different colorectal cancer types 
type one, type two, to type three, for example, here in this figure, and you can see the patient are stratified in different subtypes. However, now we can also have more information for those patients, even on the same subtype, we can also find what treatments would work and would benefit the patient or what treatment is not going to benefit the patient. Prognostic markers, those are the ones that we take into consideration in precision medicine, and that's how we are doing this at Hogue. I have a patient example, it's very interesting, a story for precision medicine program. Patient is a 69 year old lady with papillary thyroid cancer. She was diagnosed elsewhere six years ago. She had surgery and then the surgery was followed by radioactive iodine. Unfortunately, the patient recurred with metastatic papillary cancer three, day, three years later, and then she had another surgery. And then recently she was referred to one of our Hope doctors, which is one of the doctors actually part of the precision medicine program. He's a director of a precision me medicine and program doctor Jamir that had um, she's he's also a surgeon a neuroendocrine surgeon here at Hogue so he did a core needle biopsy and sent a sample for genetic testing of the tumor if we didn't have that genetic testing of the tumor the patient would have different therapeutic options like um, treatment with with a treatment as called then vatnib or radiation but in her tumor, we were able to identify a change in a DNA in a gene called NTRK1 or NTRK1. This change is called fusion. So in the genetics world, we, uh, we tend to have different uh, words for one meaning. So change in a DNA, often you hear it as a mutation, variation, alteration. So we have different changes in a, in a DNA and a gene. This is a specific one called fusion. Fusion is when one gene is fused to another gene, and that's the gene is fused is the one that should be off most of the time, but with the fusion to other gene, turn this gene to be turned on and working on all the time, and that's how it leads to cancer. So, NTRAC genes, there are three different NTRAC genes, NTRAC 1, 2, and 3, that they um, encode for the protein TRK, A, B, and C. So these um, proteins are involved in development and maintenance of nervous system. So they should not be on all the time, but when we have fusion on any of these genes, you see a lot of proteins down that will be activated and that leads to cell division in abnormal way and those cells have more survival meaning that in order for them to to be survived they they this fusion gene change the behavior of those cells and that leads to tumor and cancer and that's the story for our patient our patient has this fusion one of the fusions on track one so intrac fusions are rare events. We don't see them often. They, in one study of 11,000 patients in different tumor types, they found about 0.2% uh, intrac fusions. They can be seen either in adult or pediatric cancers in different uh, tumor types. You see here in the thyroid cancer, we've seen intrac fusion as well as some other cancer types in um, children and adults. So this fusion, although they're rare, but we always look for these rare events because if we can find it in one patient and be able to help that patient, that's the best thing for the end of the day for us. So FDA approved two drugs for 
all the fusions in all these three genes, NTRAC1 or 2, 3, they're and NTRAC inhibitors. One in 2018 called Leratorectinib, which had 75% overall response rate. And the other one approved a year after in 2019 with called Entractinib with 57 overall response. So this was a great um, approval. This approval came for all tumor types. They call it tumor agnostic, meaning that it doesn't matter where the tumor is. If the tumor has this genetic change, then this is approved. This, these two drugs are approved. On those figures on the right, the top and the bottom, they are called waterfall plots. And um, the, the waterfall plots in the research, clinical research, we want to see them in a percentage change to go in a negative way. So if you see the lines in, in, in two figures, the one on the bottom that goes down, the change of sh shrinkage of the tumor goes in a negative way, meaning that drug is working. So you see on both drugs that there is um, a percentage change um, in, in tumors, uh, regardless as uh, regardless of where the tumor is, um, that is um, now approved. So this is exciting. There are some other um, FDA approval of tumor agnostic, meaning it doesn't matter where the tumor is for immune therapy, for, for tumors that they have a deficient uh, MMR um, or microsatellite instability or high TMB, the, this, there, there is approval the, regardless of where the tumor is. That's one of the approvals from FDA. So going back to our patient, the patient um, had this fusion, although rare, we found it through the biopsy that was done. Patient has started on laratrectinib. So when the patient was referred to, to one of our HOAG doctors, she had problems swallowing. But since a couple of months she started on the medication, she knows that her swallowing is improved. She had some issues with her voice. Her voice is continuing to get stronger. And an ultrasound measurement shows decrease in size of tumor in the neck. So this is a great story. We have several other stories that um, it shows that how precision medicine, molecular profiling of the tumor, genetic counseling and genetic testing and putting them all together in a multidisciplinary way would help patients. And this is how we do at HOGUE. Uh, thank you so much for listening. And I'm uh, even get back to our moderator, Dr. Eisenberg. Thank you. Thanks, Sarad. Uh, you know, the the purpose of the whole cancer programs is to leverage molecular medicine and genomics and genetics to help better define uh, early cancer risk, detection, and treatment selection, as you have seen in these first two um, uh, discussions today. I'm going to introduce our last speaker, and then we'll sort of open up for questions. Uh, Dr. Peter Chen is a radiation oncologist at Hogue. He earned his uh, master's degree in biochemical engineering at Stanford and medical degree at UCLA. Uh, Dr. Chen has been a radiation oncologist at Hogue for over 17 years and has greatly contributed to the growth of Hoag's Radiation Oncology Program, which is the largest program in Orange County. Dr. Chen is an expert in multiple radiation therapy approaches, including the very latest in radiation oncology using MRI guided therapy through the ViewRay Meridian Linear Accelerator, which he will explain to you in, in our next talk. Uh, Dr. Chen. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. Once upon a time, a long, long time ago now, I used to go out to dinner with my family in restaurants. And along the way, my wife discovered these puzzle pieces in boxes, which were great because if you put one of these in front of your four-year-old child, she might actually stay at the dinner table for more than five minutes at a time. 
but there was always a problem because inevitably one of these pieces would fall to the floor and then there goes daddy crawling underneath the table uh, next to the fallen leftovers and the sticky stuff looking for this puzzle piece because I knew that in that moment for a happy dinner having the right piece is everything. Now, why am I talking about my daughter's puzzle pieces when my talk is about what's new in radiation oncology, and in particular, the new V-Ray Meridian system, which delivers a treatment which is called adaptive MR-guided radiation therapy? Well, to talk about the capabilities and what we can do with this new machine, uh, let me just spend a couple of minutes describing how we deliver radiation and some of the challenges we face. So we have these radiation machines, these linear accelerators that throw out beams of cancer killing radiation. And they've got these leaves in them that can jump into position to shape the beams and even move in and out within the beams to modulate the intensity within each segment. And we've got treatment planning software that can model the behavior of these beams as they pass through the body, delivering dose, and we have stacks of supercomputers that can go through billions of calculations to figure out the optimal way to configure and combine these beams such that we end up with a radiation plan. And this radiation plan is an accumulation of dose within the body that gives radiation to the areas we want it to go, or tumor areas, and keeps it away from the surrounding sensitive structures where we don't want it to go. And if you trace the outline of this radiation dose distribution, you might find that it looks familiar. Isn't the problem of delivering radiation a little bit like finding that last puzzle piece to complete the picture? Well, it is and it is. Because inside of our bodies is this whole dynamic world that really goes underappreciated. Our stomachs are filling and emptying. We're taking in air as we breathe and letting it out. And everything in our body is shifting and moving, even when we think that we're still, such as if we're a patient lying on a treatment table waiting for radiation therapy. So we might take a CT scan, a uh, snapshot in time of a patient's entire anatomy, and we might create this perfect radiation plan that completes the picture but if things change by the time we get to treatment, what happens if we have a piece that no longer fits? Well, this is where the V-Ray Meridian comes into play. In basic terms, this is the combination of an MRI scanner and a linear accelerator or radiation machine. And these two technologies are actually not supposed to go together. The magnetic field of the MRI scanner should interfere with all the charged particles that the linear accelerator is throwing out. But somehow, these brilliant engineers have put the chocolate together with the peanut butter, and now we have this fantastic new combination. And just to give you a sense of how new this technology is, there were only about a dozen in the nation when Hogue installed ours. This is the first and only unit of its kind in Orange County. And we treated our first patient just in December of last year. So to talk about the capabilities of the, uh, the V-Ray Meridian and MR-guided adaptive radiation therapy, let me take you through the treatment process and the experience of one of the first patients that we treated um, on the system. This is a woman with metastatic pancreatic cancer and I just talked to her on the phone yesterday, and we really couldn't have picked a nicer patient to help us start our program. Uh, she was enrolled in the QUILT 88 protocol, which is another great opportunity to have innovative and novel care, um, advanced care at Hogue. It's a protocol uh, where Tara, Dr. Tara Siri, the principal investigator, and I have been treating patients from all over the country and even internationally, and it involves the delivery of chemotherapy with some novel immunotherapy agents, along with high-dose focused radiation therapy, which we also call stereotactic body radiation therapy, or SBRT. 
So our patient's treatment begins with a planning session, which is called a simulation. And this is the MRI from that day taken with the V-Ray machine. And outlined in red, we can see our tumor. And right next to it, outlined in green, we see some structures which are loops of small bowel. Now, a tumor in this location is actually free to move in the abdomen. And those loops of small bowel are pretty sensitive to high doses of radiation therapy. So we have a great need for precision, and yet we're dealing with moving targets. It's enough to discourage one from even attempting this kind of a treatment. And indeed, when our patient comes back for her first day of treatment, we see that the tumor is not exactly in the same position, and it's not exactly in the same shape, and the change and the shifting in the loops of bowel are even more dramatic. But with the new V-ray meridian system, we can now identify or recontour the tumor and the location of the day, and also, which again is in red, and also these loops of bowel, which is in a kind of hard to see orange brownish sort of color. And now, we can rerun our plan through that treatment planning software, through those stacks of supercomputers. And now we've adapted our plan to match the conditions of the day. Now it's time for treatment. And during treatment, we're, uh, we're going to run a continuous MRI scan, which we can do because this is a magnetic field. It doesn't have any potentially harmful radiation like a CT scan or fluoroscopy. And we can identify the patient's tumor here shown in red, and then a treatment field, which is shown in yellow. And then we instruct our patient to breathe in until the red circle coincides with the yellow circle. And then when the tumor is exactly in the right place, the beam will turn on. And she will hold her breath in this fashion uh, for short periods, 25 or 30 seconds, while she gets bursts of radiation treatment. And then she gets to, uh, to rest and will repeat the process until her treatment is complete. And in this fashion, we can deliver radiation in a very precise manner, even for moving targets, all leading to a more safe and effective treatment. And so our patient does complete the four treatments in the protocol. And she does very well with virtually no side effects from the radiation. And here we see her early response. At one month after treatment, the tumor is shrinking. At three months after treatment, you can barely see a remnant of where the tumor used to be. And the same uh, patient, we treated this lung tumor. It's a very small tumor, just about one centimeter in size. And when we were approaching this, I, I actually did not even know if we would be successful in treating this with the technology, but indeed we were able to image and adapt and use our breath hold techniques in gating to treat this tiny tumor with very tight margins and here we see the result three months later, again, uh, proving that we hit our target. There's just a small remnant or scar left where there used to be a viable tumor. I want to show a couple of other movies uh, from other patients. And first to show an upgrade that we've had to the system since we started in December. Uh, at that time, we were imaging at four frames per second, and this has been improved to eight frames per second, and you can really see the improvement in clarity. The second reason why I want to show some more movies are because I think they're just so much fun to watch. Uh, look at the liver at the bottom of the screen. Did you know that it was so squishy? Or these branching blood vessels, and I've seen these a million times on CT scans, but somehow to see them in motion just makes them feel so much more alive. And from a radiation oncologist perspective, it is extremely satisfying to see the tumor that I want to treat, again outlined in red, move into perfect position in the treatment field, again outlined in yellow. 
And this way I can make that treatment feel very tight. And I can do this because I can see what I'm doing. Now, this ability to see what you're treating while you are treating it is so novel in the world of radiation oncology that we're still learning the situations in which it's useful. So here's a patient with a tumor, and unfortunately, it progressed to the point where it made this patient blind in her right eye. And so it was critically important to preserve the vision in her remaining functioning left eye and to keep the radiation away from the nerves that go to that eye. And so initially, I intended to use the V-Ray system to identify the structures. And here you can see it did that very well. We can see the optic chiasm, this critical structure, which is really only a couple millimeters in diameter. Uh, we could uh, identify the structure, adapt the plan, and know that we were treating her to keep this uh, structure safe. Now, I didn't think that the motion management or the real-time monitoring would have much benefit in this patient. After all, the skull is a fixed structure. Our brains don't move when we breathe. And when we treat brain tumors, we also fit patients with a thermoplastic mask that helps them to get into and maintain their position. But because of cognitive issues, uh, this patient unfortunately was not able to fully comply with treatment. And so on her second treatment, and if we could just, um, if we could just advance to the next bookmark here, what you will see is that she's actually moving in her mask. And her chin is dropping. And the tumor is moving outside of the treatment field. But because we were monitoring this in real time, we could see it. We could stop the treatment and then move on to an alternative and mobilization strategy, focus on coaching. And ultimately, this patient was able to complete her, rain, her remaining treatments all under continuous monitoring so that we knew we were giving her exactly the treatment that we intended. And so this has been my introduction to the U-Ray Meridian system. It's a combination of the MRI and uh, linear accelerator, uh, a combination of MRI and linear accelerator technology. It delivers this new treatment, which is called MR-guided adaptive radiation therapy. It uses onboard MRI imaging, adaptive planning so that we can adjust and react to the conditions of the day, real-time monitoring with continuous MRI CINE to react to the conditions of the moment, and motion management through breath hold techniques and gating so that we can contend with that dynamic world that's within us. Giving us the right pace at the right time, every time. Thank you and I wish everybody listening a rapid return to happy dinners out with your families very soon. And now I'll pass it back to our moderator, Dr. Eisenberg. I think, Peter, that was great. Uh, technology is amazing. Um, and so what we're gonna do is we're gonna try to get some questions uh, answered uh, and I'll continue these in time permitting. Um, so, uh, we'll put everyone on screen. Great. So I'm going to start with Dr. Ulaner. And um, a question for you, Gary, is uh, molecular imaging and therapy applicable for all cancer types? Well, thank you, Bert, for that, uh, uh, that question. Um, uh, uh, as we described, uh, molecular imaging and therapy uh, works kind of like that key fitting into a lock. So the real question is finding the lock and then designing a key. So this is, in theory, applicable to uh, any malignancy if you can find the right lock and design the right key. Um, but as of now, uh, uh, the, the field of molecular imaging still has a limited number of locks that it targets and a limited number of keys that it has to, uh, 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 to uh, affect patient care. 
Uh, my great belief is that we are on a huge upslope. And within the next uh, five to 10 years, there should be a key and a lock to, uh, identified, not only for virtually every type of malignancy, uh, but also for um, multiple other uh, types of diseases as well, like inflammation, uh, infections, uh, that can uh, uh, neurology, cardiology, and that is really going to uh, uh, make molecular imaging and therapy uh, uh, a, a, a cornerstone of uh, virtually every type of medicine. Great. I, and I know you're working on a few new antibodies uh, right now. So we'll hopefully there'll be more to this story and uh, we'll be able to discuss that at a later date. Um, Dr. Drabi, question, uh, can precision medicine be used for a cancer like melanoma? Uh, yes, that's a great question. Uh, melanoma is, is part of um, the disease group that we send the tumors for molecular profiling and is one of the disease group that we present at the case conference in-depth analysis of the melanoma cases. So um, we have internal protocol that we, we profile uh, the tumor of, of the patient with melanoma. Also, if the patient with a personal and family history, they might be eligible for genetic counseling and genetic testing as well. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Chen, so when using uh, uh, Bure, the technology, uh, does it actually minimize the side effects like radiation burns compared to other types of radiation delivery uh, devices? That's a great question. And I think uh, what I was trying to show in the uh, presentation was the benefits of being both able to adapt to conditions of the day and also to treat moving targets with very tight margins. And when we do this, uh, and we're enabled to do this by being able to see what we are treating while we're treating, we can either increase the dose to the structure that we're treating or diminish the dose or the volume that's receiving excess dose outside of it. And that's a great way to reduce side effects of treatment. Okay, thanks. Gary, another one? This is the one we get a lot, but so how do PET scans compare and contrast to your type of scan? What's the difference? Uh, the difference is the, the agent. Um, so a PET scan, we said, is this positron emission tomography. And that PET scan is a, is a machine uh, that allows us to visualize radiation that's being emitted. So there are, right now, uh, most people refer to a, a, a PET scan as really a fluorodeoxyglucose or FDG PET scan. And that's utilized for a, a number of malignancies because a number of cancers like to eat sugar. And the, the basis of FDG is a sugar molecule that's been radio labeled so that you can see where the sugar goes in the PET scanner. So that is the, like the prototypical PET scan. Um, most of the molecular imaging studies that I do are also PET scans. We've just given a different agent into the bloodstream, and then the PET scanner is seeing where those different agents go within the body. So instead of seeing an FDG PET scan, which is a sugar PET scan, um, we could do the prostate-specific membrane antigen PET scan or the estrogen receptor-targeted PET scan. So these are all... Um, uh, PET scans, and I think in the future, uh, uh, people will get used to the fact that there are going to be lots and lots of different PET scans um, as more of these molecular imaging agents are developed and utilized in the clinic. Yeah, we often talked about uh, cancer as a sweet tooth for the FDG PET. So, um, Dr. Drabi, um, someone wants to know how they access precision medicine at home. Thank you for that question. Uh, we often get that question. So if the patient is 
um, using any Hoag services, any seeing any Hoag affiliated physicians, they already accessing precision medicine program. This program is provided to all patients at Hoag and all physicians that are affiliated at Hoag. But they can always welcome to ask their physicians. So we're not directly um, in interacting with patients, but we're interacting with their physicians. Okay. And uh, Dr. Chen, um, we saw the, the technology and the capabilities, but what is the best uh, patient profile for uh, recommending ViewRay? Is it for every patient or just certain types of cancers and, and individuals? Great question. And I think it's really interesting to see um, how different institutions are approaching this. And uh, I think we all have different interests and we're all using the different technologies in different ways. I've been particularly interested in using it in tumors in the abdomen and also in particular for these high dose focus treatments, which we sometimes call stereotactic body radiation therapy uh, and particularly for mobile targets. So targets, uh, liver metastases, uh, targets in the pancreas, uh, mesenteric nodules, uh, lung tumors. And I've also treated uh, in the CNS, as we've seen. Um, Dr. Cox in my group is also interested in applying this to uh, patients with prostate cancer. And uh, I think in other institutions, we, we've seen uh, interest in applying it towards breast cancer. So I think there's a lot of wide uh, applicability to the technology. And uh, to be honest, we're, we're still learning. We're still learning exactly those situations in which it became, it can become the most useful. Uh, and so I think we'll uh, continue to see the technology evolve and, and have wider and wider application. Great. And Dr. Ulaner, uh, another question. Um, this concerns PSA levels. And someone wants to know what, at what PSA level is molecular imaging useful? Right. That, that is a more complicated uh, question than just a number. You can think of it as, as a continuum. The higher your PSA level gets, the more likely the PSMA scan, so PSA is prostate-specific antigen, and that's a test in the blood, and our pets are PSMA, prostate-specific membrane antigen. So the higher the PSA gets in blood, the more likely we are to find what we're looking for on a PSMA. But there's no one number where you say it's useful here and it's not useful here. Um, uh, below a level of, of a 0 0.2 uh, nanograms per milliliter, um, uh, the chance of finding something on a PSMA PET scan is quite low, so we don't recommend it. Around a 0.5, you have about a 50-50 chance of finding a site of disease. And then again, the higher the PSA goes beyond that, the more likely it is that you'll find uh, what you're looking for. And one final question, Gary. Uh, someone wants to know if the, is, is, is there actually a cost for the molecular imaging trials? Well, everything has a cost, but we're lucky enough that those costs for many of our molecular imaging trials are covered uh, by research grants, such as the National Institutes of Health grant that we have for the myeloma imaging trial, as well as industry and tremendous philanthropic support that we have from the Hogue community that helps cover the cost of these uh, studies for patients. So our prostate cancer trial, our breast cancer trial, and the myeloma trial, the PET imaging, the agents in the PET imagery, imaging, while they obviously have costs, they're free to the patients because we have funding from research grants, companies, and philanthropic support to cover these uh, amazing uh, uh, imaging modalities. Great, and and uh, I think that's a uh, that's a huge 
point for our clinical research trials in general. Most patients who participate in these, the uh, most of the cost is uh, or cost burden is is uh, within the trial. So, um, so this was great. Uh, a great review of some of the new programs and technologies that we have at the at Hogue and the Hogue Family Cancer Institute. I want to thank all of our presenters uh, and uh, just let everybody know uh, that if there is any further questions or need for information that uh, there'll be a, a slide following uh, the discussion uh, to let everybody know how you can contact the Hope Family Cancer Institute. I wanna thank all of the audience and their participation and for their time and joining us this evening. Appreciate it very much. Thank you for the opportunity to be with you tonight, Bert. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.